If you're going to write code to create and manipulate a two-dimensional array variable, it's essential that you can visualize the data you're working with. Very often, a two-dimensional array variable is used to store groups of related data items, like the data you can see here. A two-dimensional array can therefore be thought of as a table. These are the data we're going to use in this video. Each row of the table contains the details of a different famous person. The first column contains their first names. The second contains their last names. The third column is gender, then we have nationalities, and finally their occupations, what it is each person is famous for. Notice that each column has an index number. Counting starts from zero, so the fifth column is column number four. Each row also has an index number, and these are also numbered from zero. It's useful to think of this table as having a horizontal dimension, which we'll refer to as the X dimension, and a vertical dimension, which we'll refer to as Y, just like the X and Y axes of a line chart. When you're coding up a two-dimensional array for a different set of data, I strongly recommend that you keep a sketch of it handy, like I'm going to do now. I can declare my two-dimensional array variable like this. I'm using a naming convention here. A because it's an array variable, ST because it's an array of strings, and people because that's what the data is. In brackets, I've specified the X dimension first, followed by a comma, and then the Y dimension and I've used the AS clause to specify that this is an array of strings. Now I'm keeping my sketch of the data handy while I populate this array. It's important to get this right, otherwise you might get some very peculiar behaviour when you run your programme. I want to put Barrack in the first column and the first row. I want Obama in the second column and the first row. The third column, first row, contains male. And column number three, row number zero, contains American. It takes a little bit of getting used to counting from zero. And the final piece of data for this person is president. Now it's tempting to start copying and pasting, but I want to make sure I get this absolutely right. So I'm going to continue entering the values individually, just for now, working from my sketch. Let's get the New Zealand Prime Minister in next. As with the previous famous person, I've specified the column number first, followed by the row number. I've specified X, followed by Y. Notice that the value of X is different for each data item, but the value of Y is always the same, because Y is the row number. Let's do one more very carefully, and then I'll speed things up with a bit of copying and pasting. And I've just realised that I've made a mistake. It's very easy to do. That's more like it. Now you could initialise each individual element of this array in any order you like. The important thing being that it's fully initialised. But taking a systematic approach like this will help to ensure, if not guarantee, you won't make any silly mistakes. A systematic approach will also help to ensure that all of the data gets in there. But I can see a pattern emerging now, 
so I'm going to start copying and pasting to speed things up a little bit. Now one last look at my sketch just to make sure I've got everything there, that should be there, and straight away I can see I need to change these twos to fives. And there it is, the code I need to declare and populate my two-dimensional array. So that's how we get data in. How do we get data out? It's actually very simple. If you've ever played a game like Battleships, With this message box statement, I'm going to output whatever is in column 4, row 3. In this case, the word scientist. What if I want to output, let's say, New Zealand? That's in column 3, row 1. Or perhaps the word Swiss. That's row 3, column 3. It's just a matter of supplying the appropriate coordinates. I can also supply these coordinates using variables. Now I could call these variables anything I like, but it makes perfect sense to call them X and Y. Can you see which data item will be output by this message box? Let's see. Now, just like a one-dimensional array, the real power of a two-dimensional array is realised when you combine it with looping constructs. Let's suppose I want to output all of the information about Barack Obama. Notice that with Barack Obama, it's the x-dimension which is changing from 0 to 4, but the y-dimension remains at 0. I can do this. In fact, I don't even need the variable y. Suppose instead I want to output the details of Mahatma Gandhi. Again, it's the x value which varies, but the y value stays the same. In this case, y remains at 4. You should make sure that you're comfortable with this idea before you continue. Let's try Ada Lovelace. Ada Lovelace is in row number 2, so the value of y has to remain the same inside this loop. It has to be 2. Alternatively, I might decide that I want to display all of the values in a particular column. For example, I might want to display all of the last names. If we examine the data, we can see that every last name has the same value of x. Obama is 1, 0. Ardern is 1, 1. Lovelace, 1, 2. Einstein, 1, 3. Gandhi is 1, 4. And Van Gogh is 1, 5. It's the value of y which is changing this time. So I could write my loop like this. But notice that y varies from 0 to 5. So this time it's the value of x which is remaining the same inside the loop, but y is the value that changes. Perhaps I want to display all of the nationalities. Looking at the code, I can see that all of the nationalities have an x value of 3.
Again, you should make sure that you're comfortable with doing this before you proceed. In the next video, I'll show you how we can get all of the data out using nested loops.